Assalamu alaikum my dear brothers and sisters and thank you for joining us for another series of current events. Like always, I'm your host Ali Jassim. ISIS, ISIL, Daesh or whatever the terrorist extremist Takfiri group calls itself is a Salafi militant group that follows a strict Wahhabi doctrine. It first began referring to itself as the so-called Islamic State in June 2014 when it proclaimed itself a worldwide caliphate and named Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi as its caliph. As a caliphate, it supposedly claims religious, political, and military authority over all Muslims worldwide. The group's adoption of the name Islamic State and its notion of a caliphate have been widely condemned and rejected by the United Nations, various governments, and international organizations, arguing that the group has strayed from the path of the true Islam and that its actions do not reflect the religion's real teachings or virtues. ISIS is highly fanatical, killing anyone who does not accept and obey its laws. Proficient at social media, ISIS is widely known for its videos of beheadings and barbaric executions of both soldiers and civilians, including journalists and aid workers, and its destruction of cultural heritage sites. Unfortunately, there are countries supporting this evil organization, which led to it controlling a vast landlocked territory in Iraq and Syria, and became one of the, if not the most powerful terrorist organization in the world today. The Iraqi army and the Hajj al-Shaabi, or the volunteer fighters who accepted the call to defend the holy shrines issued by Iraq's top Shia cleric, are combating and pushing back the advance of ISIS. In retaliation, ISIS has made surprise attacks across Iraq, inflicting maximum casualties with the aim of spreading fear before withdrawing. So what happens next? How will all of this end? Now there is a lot more information about this dangerous disease, which we will discuss today with our dear guest Dr. Hassan Abbas an academic and professor at a university in Washington, D.C. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hassan Abbas. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Dr. Hassan Abbas, let us start by unfolding what the terrorist organization ISIS really is. I would say ISIS, in principle, is a combination um, of factors that are at play, uh, which will help me define ISIS. ISIS is a terrorist organization ISIS is a criminal organization and ISIS is also trying um, different methods uh, which are used often by insurgent groups. So it is a terrorist organization, it's an insurgent group and it is a criminal organization. Where did it originate and why did it originate in those particular areas? I think there are three ways in which we can understand the origins um, and the formation of ISIS. One is theological or religious side, if I may say that. Second is its beginning and its origin in a political sense. And third is its origins in the context of a militant or terrorist organization. These are three different streams of thought uh, which, which we, we have to understand. First, uh, in terms of its theological past, which I think it's, um, it's not a new phenomenon. Its history is quite old. Uh, it, it borrowed elements from other extremist conservative um, organizations within the Islamic world. Um, you can link this with the Salafi thought, you can link it with the Takfiri thought, and these are new, not new thoughts. They have been historically extremist organizations. I would go as early as Khawarij, uh, from where those elements which right from the beginning of Islam had issues with the central ideas of Islam and they had a very rigid extremist viewpoint. So it is Salafism in that sense, it is Takfiri ideology, it is also borrowed elements from Wahhabi, or, uh, Wahhabi theology, I would argue it is also borrowed arguments or uh, beliefs, extremist ideas. Uh, from, from Deobandi the school of thought. So it's a combination of all those theological ideas. Uh, that is the theological or religious side of it. Second comes its political origins. Its political origins are very much linked uh, to politics uh, and security issues in broader Middle East. Um, in Iraq, in Syria, these appear to be the very modern um, context in which ISIS was able to develop itself 
gets its momentum, uh, borrow ideas, and, and it was linked with politics um, without understanding what was happening with pro Assad support or anti Assad support in Syria. That is one context. In case of Iraq, the way it was linked with Baathist ideas. I mean, many of the leaders of um, of ISIS in Iraq are old Baathists um, who, who realized that they had lost power. They wanted to regain power and they needed a religious slogan because that was the most popular thing. So the politics um, in Iraq, the Baathist politics of Saddam Hussein, this is a legacy of Saddam Hussein. In Iraq, in Syria also, it is, it is linked to that. Many other countries, um, elements, extremist elements in Egypt, in Libya, um, in Turkey, they all ganged together and provided it a political space. Now, after looking at the theological issues which I explained, then looking at the political ones, the third is the militant one. From where these guys, even if they have that ideology, even they have that political space, from where they learned uh, the military tactics, and that will have to come to Al Qaeda in Iraq, led by Zarqabi. That that created that model. Many of these extremists and terrorists uh, spent time in Abu Ghraib prison. Uh, so there's that idea that they they got together the opportunity when they were put in prison by the coalition forces, by United States and other forces, and they ganged together. Then Al Qaeda's ideology, and even I would argue Taliban ideology, gave them that training space in which they fought against international forces in Afghanistan, where they fought against U.S. forces and other coalition forces in, in Iraq, that provided them that militant training. And the last but not the least was this battleground in Syria. That gave them the militant training, which was all by Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. These are all the terrorist organizations which fed into this, this new idea of the so-called Islamic State. So th that's how I would explain the three origins or the three streams which made ISIS a reality. Thank you for that, Dr. Abbas. Some call it ISIS, others ISIL, and now all we see circulating in media is IS. Can you clarify what these acronyms stand for and why are they constantly changing? I think there is some um, this classification or categorization is because of making it more understandable and easy to understand. So for instance, um, it started off by calling itself Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, yeah. which confines it only to Iraq and Syria. So United States, in fact, and President Obama said, no, it is ISIL. And there was a reason why he was pushing it, because that stands for Islamic State in the Levant, which is a more broader area. And I think that is true because we have now seen ISIS attacks in in Afghanistan. We saw they, they have killed um, the Hazara uh, uh, minority Shia community yeah. uh, in Afghanistan. ISIS had tried to conduct terrorist attacks a few in Pakistan. We know that in European countries that is happening. So it is a much broader, unfortunately, a much broader terrorist organization and they have a much broader space. So that's why we, we call them ISIL also so that it explains a broader area. They, I think, the, in my way, view, for the Arab world or the Arab-speaking world or the broader Muslim world, the word Daesh is also very important because it, it has a derogatory meaning, but that's what it explains them about their value. But last but not the least, the very phrase Islamic State, because they are calling themselves. Yeah. However, there is, I have a slight issue with that. Because if you start calling it, and they call, start calling themselves Islamic State, which they, they want to call it, because that's uh, the message they want to project to the whole world. But for the non-Muslim world, and for the, if I may say, parts of the Western world, and Eastern world, China, United States, Russia, if all of, if they will hear the whole Muslim world calling, allowing these terrorists and thugs to call themselves Islamic State, then many people who don't have the uh, knowledge or uh, understanding about Islamic history, they will think, oh yes, this is the ideal Islamic model. Whereas this is exactly opposite of what Islam stands for. So yes, they call themselves Islamic State, but I would rather pick a word, um, they, they are the modern day terrorists, they are Daesh. Um, and so I, I am more inclined to call them Daesh uh, or, or by names as a typical terrorist group rather than allowing themselves to claim this mantle of Islam by calling themselves Islamic State. 
Thank you for that. How did it become such a powerful terrorist organization that has recruited thousands of fighters from all around the world along its ranks in such a short period of time? I think one thing that really favored the rise of ISIS was timing. Mm -hmm. um, because the question can be asked, why it never happened in 1980s yeah. or 1990s um, or, or afterwards, soon after the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks? I think because the ideas generated by Taliban, by Al-Qaeda, by Al-Qaeda in Iraq, by Jabhat al-Nusra, by other extremist groups, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, extremist groups in South Asia and in Middle East, those had created a space in terms of ideology, in terms of ideas, in, ter in, ter in terms of these terrible new um, writings uh, or speeches by extremist Muslims all across the Muslim world. They were in minority, but through their bigotry, through their bad ideas, they created a modern space for a group like ISIS. And ISIS just came in at a time when those ideas, those bad ideas, those, those extremist ideas, those narrow-minded ideas had created a space. And then the political situation was right. There was the, the Arab Spring, which created a lot of hope. Then there was kind of the fall of the Arab Spring. Um, then the, the idea of, of a new movement in Egypt. Um, then the military coming back. Uh, the new the rise of, uh, of politics and, and kind of a very vibrant politics linked to ideas of religion in Turkey. Or the crisis in Iraq. So the timing was such. Uh, so the most important thing is timing. A religious narrative was created beforehand by those extremist organizations, the timing now was such because of the military conflict. And the third thing which was linked to this was the general frustration in the Arab world by young ordinary people who want a hopeful future, who, who are open-minded. The, the Arab young people in all, all across the Arab world, I think they are very intelligent people. They want a good future for them. But when their own governments are narrow-minded, when they are, they, they is kind of harassment, oppression. So that oppression and that fear also created a certain element of, of, of frustration. So we teach them Islam had a great past. But then when they see the reality today, they find Muslim states to be poor in education, poor in health uh, uh, provision, poor in infrastructure, whether it is roads, about airlines, about transport, about education. They have nothing to be proud of, but they, they are told that there is this great myth that once upon a time Islam was a, was a great uh, empire or, or, or there are various imp Muslim empires and they are right. They were Ottomans, they were Safavids, um, they were Fatimids, they were Mughals, they were great Muslim empires which were ruling the world. So this disconnect creates a certain frustration. So as I mentioned, the narrative of Al-Qaeda and Taliban, conflict and war, poor economic situation, no modern development, and then frustrations. And the one major difference is that now all these young people through their iPhones or their Samsung phones or whatever, yeah. they, Facebook, Twitter, all these, uh, WhatsApp, the young Muslim in the Arab world and in, in the broader Muslim world, I would include all Muslim countries in South Asia, Iran, Turkey, Middle East, they are now, they have an exposure to the Western world and they see the development um, the great things that are happening also, and there's a lot of glamour linked with the uh, with, with many Western ideas of entertainment, of Hollywood, of, of so many other things, and they see their own plight. That disconnect creates further frust frustration because they see that there's a different world that exists also, and for them the reality is a very bad reality. Th that kind of disconnect and frustration then allows them to go and join hands with anyone who's saying that they will build a new idea. So for an ordinary Muslim going to fight in Syria, they don't know about the reality at times. They just think that this new Islamic state will be peaceful, will help them get education, new opportunities. I mean, they are not fully aware of all the atrocities and terrible things that ISIS is doing. So these all things then combine to create an environment where many young people go into it. When they go there, they'll feel frustrated and some of them will feel um, adventure in doing all those extremist um, acts. They'll be majority, I think, which will get disgruntled very soon.
We all know the apparent countries who are supporting and funding these terrorists. Let me say one thing here. If one country supports violence and killing innocent civilians, doesn't that make them terrorists as well? Why don't we start calling those countries as terrorist countries? First and foremost, um, the way that the modern state system, uh, what we in the West we call Westphalia system, the way it developed after the Second World War, these new states um, in, in many cases are either uh, a product of historical developments. For instance, um, the Ottoman Empire gave way to this modern Turkey, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India, they, they are products of, of also their old empires, but also the colonial legacy. Uh, the modern states are different. They went through industrial revolution and renaissance. In the modern sense, states pursue their interests, um, whether, and you pick any country in Middle East uh, or, or in Asia, whether it is China, Russia, or it is Iran or Iraq, and other countries, in their heydays, they support groups that are outside their own country or they support at times groups which allow them to pursue their foreign policy agendas uh, without getting into an open warfare because open warfare becomes very problematic uh, for economy for development so this is i can't think of any major country muslim countries arab nations non-arab muslim states um, in the west as well who at different times in the western world as well at different times develop coalitions with non-state actors, I'll call these terrorist organizations in some ways non-state actors, to pursue their own agendas, to pursue their interests at times. For instance, the Afghan Jihad, so-called, um, against the former Soviet Union in 1980s. United States, United Kingdom, France, Germany, most Muslim countries, Pakistan was at the forefront of getting all those fighters from various Muslim countries, mostly Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, um, and, and training them to fight Soviet Union because that was seen as the only way you can defend Afghanistan against a country which is anti-religion, like the like communist state. Mm -hmm. So this has been happening since a long time. This is not something good uh, at, at all, but this is a reality on the ground. So if you start calling states, terrorist states by, by this uh, notion, I think any state any modern powerful state or states which want to be powerful, they will all get into this category. Mm -hmm. The broader issue is that that's why states have to improve their security. Yeah. That's why international laws, especially with the United Nations, have to be improved so that if you have evidence against country X and you are a member of the United Nations, you can go to the United Nations and make a claim that country X is trying to play their own games through theological issues, through funding, through these madrasa networks, which are unfortunately, madrasa was, was something which provided all the knowledge in the Muslim world. Today, the word madrasa is, is, is now seen in a negative sense. So yes, countries should be put on the spot. If any country has evidence, um, it should be projected through media, it should be projected to international organizations, through NGOs. And I think if the knowledge about the mistakes of the various states in, in supporting such extremist groups, if that is credible, then it, it, a, lot of, not, a lot of effort has to go into projecting it to the media throughout the world and through international organizations. And hopefully that will at least expose some of those countries because in, when we normally say a country, it may not be the whole of the country. Yeah. It may be one organization in that country. It may be an intelligence agency. It may be a security agency. It may be the politicians only uh, who, who might be behind it. It may be an authoritarian individual who might be behind it. Often, I'll give you one example. During the Saddam Hussein era, Iraq was associated with many bad things yeah. uh, which they had supported. Saddam Hussein was doing terrible things. He was in one case at war with Iran because that was the agenda which, which, which suited him and the countries, uh, various countries in the West who, 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 who wanted um, uh, that kind of an idea. But then you cannot today blame the whole of Iraq that in 1970s, the whole of Iraq was doing bad things. No, it was Saddam Hussein and his close regime, his close people. The ordinary Iraqis were the victims themselves. So it's if you we start blaming countries, it then blame the whole people who may not even be aware of it. Yeah. So I am more inclined towards in, referring to individuals and organizations which which create these bad precedents. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Hassan Abbas. How does this group associate itself to the notion of caliphate? 
And how do you compare it to the previous caliphates in history, namely the Umayyads, Abbasids, and the Ottomans? I think this modern Islamic State idea led by Abu Bakr Baghdadi and many of his other associates, um, th this is in some ways unprecedented. Unprecedented, not that I am a fan of the Umayyads or, or Abbasids, I think some of the worst atrocities in the Muslim history uh, were, were played out in Umayyads. Uh, many of the Abbasids uh, leaders were good, but many of the Abbasid kings were, were terrible people. Yeah. Same in the case of Ottomans. They, they had great contributions as well, but many mistakes were committed by some of the, the kings in Ottomans. The Islamic State, in fact, I think is the worst of them all, because it borrowed worst ideas from all Muslim history and other history. Because at the end of the day, uh, the way they are beheading people, the way they are torturing people, the way they are misusing Islam, um, yes, they were precedents in historically among the Umayyads, for example, but they are very unique in, in this sense that they only believe in violence. They have, uh, they have no modern system to govern. Umayyads, for instance, irrespective of their terrible things that they did, they expanded their own empire. They must have been providing some good stuff to their own people for their own interest. I'm giving it as, as an example. It's an Islamic state they are failing in governance they are only managing things to total harassment and fear and bind out some of the tribes um, so so this modern islamic state is is the worst um, of all that was combined in the last 1400 years they have borrowed from it and projected one new idea which only borrows from the terrible things that have happened in the islamic world Dr. Abbas, why is it that we see ISIS focusing on severe punishments and violent barbaric actions? Not many of us are used to seeing such as beheadings, mass executions, sexual violence and slavery. Additionally, how do these terrorists justify these actions with the Islamic principles? I think ISIS is doing it for the primary reason that they are short of good ideas. They have nothing good to offer and they realize that people who are coming to them will soon realize because they, they will be exposed it is because this is all about harassment and creating fear so creating fear is the best tool for ISIS because if they had some good ideas spiritual ideas some great political ideas some great ideas of governance uh, some creating some new hope they would have used those because but but they are very well aware that their prime skill or the best tool they have is to create fear and harassment and that they can only do by killing people by encouraging violence by scaring people by also trying to get all people of one kind in ethnic or religious terms together so there is no voice of dissent there is no one the Yazdis, uh, the Shias, the Christians uh, even within among the Sunnis who are progressive uh, Muslims um, from various Sufi traditions, they all are being sidelined because they, the ISIS wants no dissent. All their slogan, their banner is all about creating fear, harassment and oppression. Uh, so I'm not surprised that they are trying to make best use of the skill that they have. If they, if they had any good ideas, they would not have been an ISIS in the first place. Thank you for that, Dr. Abbas. What do you believe is the reason behind ISIS striving to deform the religion of Islam? In other words, what's in it for them? Tragically, in the, in the, we have seen this in various tra religious traditions. We have seen this among the Christians, among the Jews, among the Muslims, among Buddhists, among Hindus as well, five or six of the, these great religious traditions. That religion has been historically uh, tarnished or used and misused for political ends uh, and and this is as I'm saying this is not new or unique to, to the Muslim world because religion gives you a broader perspective and promises you the next world promises you um, uh, a heaven promises you a transformation it promises you um, an, a new world so it is easy to fool people at times also by distorting religious ideals because every worldly idea is linked only to your wealth, um, to your riches, to, to your rank, to your prestige, to money in this world. Religion provides another layer which is spiritual, which is broader, 
which is long term so it is easy to fool people when you have a, a bigger model or a bigger idea or a broader thing so that that is one reason and these people because if they were operating in a different context they would have used some, some other religious tradition in sri lanka for example they had used uh, they had distorted um, hindu and buddhist uh, uh, teachings as well uh, and before uh, suicide bombing phenomena became popular unfortunately in middle east it was the most popular uh, it was most popular in in sri lanka they and they were having a big war so my idea is religion is being used because this makes it easier for them to recruit new people because they promise them heaven and then manipulate them and maneuver them to take in whatever the direction they want them to to go dr hassan why are there no official global organizations combating isis media we know that isis has recruited hundreds of its fighters if not thousands via its social networks certainly um, i think there are not strong efforts going on against isis because of a variety of reasons um although i think situation has changed in 2014 uh, when it all started off there was total confusion um even in the west and other places people were not very clear what is happening how from out of the blue this new organization had come about because there was not enough knowledge and information about it then with the passage of time things started getting clear and people thought this is another idea which will just go away uh, but there was nothing effective done within the muslim world i'll i'll with all the due respect i'll first and foremost um i will criticize or pinpoint i should say um, uh, and and point out that there was something missing within the muslim world first and foremost in in terms of tackling isis in a strong way um so many muslim countries the arab world is very rich with oil they have strong security forces and the first strong reaction to isis should have come about from from countries like saudi arabia bahrain kuwait iran um turkey egypt uh, these are all very respected and very very important countries um they have very smart militaries we have not all these should have come up together but they were divisions and that's the tragedy within the muslim world there is this division between arab and non arab between middle east and south asia between their different politics so those who could have dealt a severe blow to isis um had their own sectarian battles their own political battles their own battles of power so that that was one thing missing the second thing was for the western world for instance for united states us was involved in iraq for many many years and they had packed up and left because the iraqi government had told them we want you to be out yes you had gotten rid of saddam hussein thank you very much you stayed here for too long we don't want you there and under president obama us forces left so now they there was this feeling among the american people who actually fund who through their taxes pay their own government's military they said we just came out of iraq there is a terrible thing going on in iraq we are no more being welcomed um the people in those country they don't like the american forces there so it was very difficult for any american politician to convince their people that well we are out but there is another problem and let's go and fight out their battle it was a very difficult political argument same goes for european union and others but with the passage of time in the last 2 years or so 3 years there was more realization that no if we are not going to go after isis and stop them they are recruiting people from from european countries they are creating a terror in europe in united states as well so there is there is now more interest because um the 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 terror tactics of isis are now imp- impacting everyone globally so it's the anti isis movement or campaign started slowly but now for instance united states is trying to help and european union is trying to help iraqi forces training them providing them air cover i uh, guess every one of us think my view is this should have happened earlier it took longer time but i think now uh, with with ground forces in iraq with hashd al shabi also doing their bit many of their groups are played a very important role in pushing back isis the iraqi forces now are better trained there is now international support as well so now things are hopefully going in the right direction but it took quite some time and and there was no coordinated international effort to make this happen 
Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan Abbas. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. This concludes our first episode of the series of ISIS here on Current Events. We thank you, dear viewers, for watching, and we thank Dr. Hassan Abbas for joining us. Please stay tuned for the second episode, which we will discuss more in depth about this topic of ISIS. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.